Hi everyone, sorry for the slight delay, a few technical hitches that couldn't be helped, but nevertheless we're here and ready. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome Ruth Busby, Great Western's HR Director, who is a more of an informal session this evening about her career and how she ended up working in the railway industry and why she enjoys it so much. So seeing as we're running late, um, I'll hand straight over to Ruth. Hello everyone and uh, I can tell you officially that I did not make my way into the rail industry through my IT skills um, but we are now on a second laptop that is accessing um, uh, this uh, webinar so uh, thank you for all joining and taking part as Wilson said this is that uh, I've not prepared any slides this is the aim of this is to be reasonably informal I think you've got a chat functionality so that Wilson can pick up questions and I'm more than happy to answer questions that you might have as we go along. I think the idea for this session was to just tell you a little bit more about how I got into the rail industry, um, share some of my experiences and um, yeah, and then answer the, any questions that you might have. Um, now, those of you who know Mark Hopwood, my boss, and many others in the rail industry um, may be expecting a tale of my long held love for the railway, my knowledge of traction, of different signal boxes and all of those sorts of things. And whilst I do have a little train behind me, um, I, that is not why I'm in the rail industry. That's not uh, my background. I joined Great Western Railway three years ago from the atomic weapons establishment. So obviously it's natural to move from um, nuclear warheads into the railway. That's just obviously what you do. So my uh, entry into the railway is somewhat different to some of the other senior leaders um, across our industry, but I'll share a little bit more uh, about that. Um, and uh, m the way I got into the rail industry, and I know this was something uh, that people were interested in knowing, is I was actually headhunted for the role. So Mark Hopwood, when he was recruiting for a new HR director, was actually quite keen to not only look at the talent within the rail industry, but to bring people in from other um, industries and different experiences to um, bring some challenge, some different, um, in, different thoughts and approaches into Great Western. And so a headhunter was commissioned to do the search and um, the result was happily me uh, getting the job at Great Western. Um, and for me, when I was approached, one of the reasons it was enticing to move into um, the railway and particularly with Great Western is because I was a, a customer. So for 10 years, I was a commuter from Didcot into um, London. I still have somewhere, I was trying to find it for day, today, but I haven't found it until I've still got a very crumpled letter from when I was pregnant with my daughter that gave me permission to sit in first class for free as part of my upgrade. And, and when I when I got that, I, I remember the first time I sat in first class, I thought, okay, I mustn't touch the newspapers. I mustn't take water. I mustn't have any of the biscuits because I'm not paying for this. Uh, by the time I was eight months pregnant, I was more than happy to have all of them. And I was very grateful to First Great Western at the time for uh, giving me that nice upgrade as, as part of that. But I'll give you a little bit of a, a career history. Um, because um, although it's very different to some other people, it will you know, give you an idea of what I've learned, what I've picked up along the way. I'll talk a little bit about some of the skills that I think have helped me from other industries and also what I've done to try and build my railway knowledge since I've been here. Um, so I um, have always taken the approach that I will do things that interest me and not think necessarily about this is interesting and it will give me X. So I had a very brief spell where I wanted to be a journalist when I was doing my A-levels and I managed to do work experience at the Guardian newspaper after writing to probably about 20 um, newspapers across the country to, to try and get some work experience. Had fantastic experience there for a couple of weeks um, and nearly um, then went into a sort of a very um, focused um, career in terms of journalism, which would have meant I would have only studied journalism and, and decided, I don't know if I was given wise advice or whether I just gave myself wise advice, that actually narrowing too much was probably um, an unwise thing to do. And actually I'd be better in doing things that interested me and then see where they took me. So I did history and American studies at university. And my uh, dissertations, because it was dual honours, were very, very different. My history dissertation was on the growth of crime in Chechnya in 1991. And my American studies dissertation was on the representation of African-American youth in um, four different um, 
uh, films, a couple of them were Spike Lee films, uh, what another was um, Do the Right Thing. So really random mix because they were just things that interested me and that's what I did and um, wasn't quite ready at the end of my degree to decide what I wanted to do for a job. So I did um, a master's in philosophy or an MPhil in post-Soviet organised crime, obviously. So uh, I think that one might be, yeah, that one is actually on the shelf. Um, and that was in the, um, the, the rise of cybercrime in Russia, in post-Soviet Russia. And uh, I have been published in Jane's Intelligence Review. So really odd choice of things to do, but they were interesting at the time. And uh, as I was sort of a couple of months into my MPhil, I decided that I didn't want to turn it into a PhD didn't want to have to learn Russian, didn't really want to go to Russia, uh, was actually quite bored of the solitary um, nature of um, research study. And someone told me that the, the civil service did a really great graduate scheme. And I knew nothing about the civil service at the time, um, but thought well, I'll, I'll give it a go, see what happens, probably won't get in, did all of the tests, um, did manage to get in. Um, I was asked what my preference was in terms of which departments and I said well either MOD or the Home Office because I like I like war and crime not in the sense of it happening but in terms of it's interesting to understand why it happens um, and got offered the Home Office which was great because I was writing a thesis on um, post-Soviet organised crime so the first posting I had in the Home Office clearly given they had a cyber crime unit and organised crime units the obvious place to put me was the family policy unit, which is which is where I then worked. And I've never done anything to do with organised crime um, since. But the the civil service was a really great um, foundation. Uh, you know, it, people you know have different backgrounds. Lots of our engineers, their their trade is mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. I say my trade is is being a civil servant, being able to write things, understand them quickly, interpret them quickly. And move on from there and uh, and whilst government can be really frustrating particularly for those of us in train operating companies in the current environment where we're trying to get things done and we want to be agile and all of those sorts of things actually my experience of the civil service was that there were lots of really hard-working people who were just really good at learning things quickly and applying it really really quickly and i had some fantastic experiences um, working for the Home Office um, I randomly met Rowan Atkinson um, when I was leading the work on um, incitement to religious hatred and taking some legislation through Parliament. Um, I got to speak randomly on radio, um, I was the private secretary to a wonderful uh, man called Martin Neri who was the chief executive of the National Offender Management Service at the point at which prisons and probations came together and uh, the civil service also gave me the opportunity to move into human resources so next to my MPhil on my shelf is my um, thesis for my master's in um, HR management and development uh, which was around the management leadership of uh, change and the, the civil service funded that um, uh, that MSc for me helped me move into HR which I always thought would be a temporary thing to just sort of broaden my options out so I wasn't just a, a policy specialist um, and, and gave me some brilliant experiences there. I, I worked in the cabinet office briefly and uh, worked quite closely with Gus O'Donnell, who was the cabinet secretary at the time, and just got to see some of the, the insights of how government works. And, and my thought was always, I would always work in the civil service. And then two things happened. Um, I fell pregnant with my daughter and while I was on maternity leave, David Cameron got elected. <laughs> and that, that's relevant because uh, it was not long after the financial crisis of 2008, I think, when that started. And um, what David Cameron did um, for, for good reason in government was to start shrinking some of the government departments, particularly the HR um, elements. So uh, the opportunities for me to be able to progress in my newfound profession within the civil service were limited at a point in which I was absent from the business because of my maternity leave and feeling a little bit vulnerable about the opportunities there for me. And I saw an advert for uh, deputy HR director at the University of Reading and thought I won't get it, but I'll go and uh, give it a go and see what happens. Was late for my interviews. Only time I've ever been late because the traffic, as some of you may know, uh, if you're in the Reading area, the traffic um, can be um, hideous. So was late for the interview. Thought I'd never get it, but um, miraculously was offered the job and and went and and worked there. And at the university was a really interesting place because it was probably more bureaucratic and slower than the civil service 
but bear in mind the bit of the civil service I work, worked in was policy making, so um, and particularly legislation, so that was quite fast paced. Um, it was very traditional in the university, whilst there's a real diversity of the student body, the staff body was very traditional, which is really challenging and it was there I started to do more work around diversity and things like that. Um, but also there was a lot of opportunity. When I originally worked in the Home Office, there were 70,000 people that worked there. So you were, even if you were relatively senior, you were quite a small cog in a big wheel. At the university, there were five and a half thousand people. So my responsibilities were much broader. So I was able to do things like pensions reform there um, to really lead and drive some stuff around diversity and inclusion, to introduce the concept of performance management um, for academics and those sorts of things. So it was a, a really good opportunity to get delve into doing a bit of everything and have a dabble. Um, and from there, I went to the atomic weapons establishment, which again is a bit of a random move, but I wanted to move into a more commercial organization. And um, the atomic weapons establishment has recently been taken back in house to government. When I was there, it was can, uh, government owned, but contractor operated. Um, and there are lots of parallels actually between AWE and the way the railways work because of the contractual arrangements with government. So obviously at AWE, the contract was with the Ministry of Defence and there was a year long period where they were working through the new contract arrangements um, for it. And it was complicated by the fact that um, the, the private operator for AWE was a conglomerate that was led by Lockheed Martin, but also with Serco and Jacobs Engineering. So you, you had some interesting things going on with the owning group dynamics and some interesting things going on with the dynamics with um, the organization. And then some real challenges within the organization where we were trying to bring innovation. Um, you had some of the brightest minds in the country, quite literally rocket scientists, um, but you had some really risky, um, blue collar operational work happening at the same time. Some real challenges around diversity and inclusion, engagement. Again, we had pensions reform to, to go through there. So um, a really good foundation for learning things. And those of you that are well versed in the, the rail industry may remember the name Ian Coucher, who at one point was the um, chief executive at Network Rail. And Ian was the uh, MD there. He joined probably about nine months after me. Um, and uh, learning Ian's uh, ways and his, his challenge and his attention to detail um, was a really good grounding for being in board level um, environments, which was really important. So when I then moved into the rail industry, it was my first step into a new industry that, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, is, is very complex. Um, Ian did take the time, he spent an hour drawing me pictures of how you make money on the railway, how it all works, the different elements of the system, who connects in with whom and all of those sorts of things. Um, so he was very gracious in, in doing that, but it was moving into a new industry and into a director role. And it was my first um, director role. So I, I, it was it was pretty nerve wracking moving in, particularly because I'm someone who likes to know as much as possible about things. And I, I feel vulnerable when I don't know and understand things. Um, the good thing that comes with that is curiosity. So I'm more than happy to ask questions and I don't worry about looking silly if I'm asking a, if I'm asking what might be perceived as a stupid question. And I think uh, particularly since I've been in the railway, I've realized that I'm quite often asking the questions that people who've been in the rail industry for a long time wanted to know, but weren't prepared to ask. Um, but I was quite nervous about moving in and, and being in this environment and how would I uh, how would I get on and survive and actually Mark and the team at Great Western were incredibly welcoming, incredibly supportive and I've, I've really, really enjoyed it. It's, I think it, it's my favourite place to work. I, there were some real high career moments from my early time in the civil service working on policy stuff. But um, being in the in the railway, I think, uh, matches that. And, and, and I think that's for two reasons. I think it's Firstly, because of the commitment to the customer and, and how focused we are on that customer experience, particularly having been one and understanding uh, what it feels like to be a commuter and to, to be sitting there delayed or, or whatever, or being treated nicely with the, the free upgrades. Um, but also the community focus and the way we interact with communities, the charitable endeavours that, that we do and the, the sort of social history really of the railways is really important and something that we often forget about when we're just thinking about trains moving backwards and forwards. Um, 
I think for me, the skills that have helped me while I've been in the rail industry, um, that curiosity that I mentioned, the willingness to challenge and ask questions, I think has been really important. And hang on a moment, I need to let my dog out so he stops making noise. Um, sorry. Everyone likes a good dog though, that's the thing. Yeah. Any, sure any sort of Zoom call pets or anything like yeah. that. Really he'll well. come back. We'll come and scratch at the door again in a minute and you will hear him winching from the other side. But if I, <laughs> I thought it's put me off. Um, yeah, that curiosity and challenge. And I think it's incumbent on all of us, particularly people who are relatively new to the industry, either because of our age or because of our length of service, to keep that curiosity and challenge going. There's so many things that we do because they've always been done that way. And actually, with the level of challenge we've got ahead of us, we just need to be challenging you know, not not in a rude way but really to ask why do we do that why are we doing it this way why does this go here and could that not go there and actually that's how you get the railway working so much better so i think there are two things that have been really helpful i think and um, what the civil service really gave me was the ability to learn quickly and apply that knowledge quickly and that's been really really helpful particularly being in a new environment i was really clear that if i was a hr director or i'm a hr director um, I don't want to be there just giving you sort of a little bit of employment advice here and there. People are at the heart of organisations and to really understand how to support people um, and colleagues to best effect and to enable leaders to be the best they can be. You need to understand the business. And uh, so I wanted to and continue to want to understand how our business operates so that we can provide the right support for our people within that environment. So I have recently finished my um, uh, Institute of Railway Operators Certificate in Railway Operations, uh, which I did alongside the apprentices at Great Western. Um, and that was really, I mean, that, I didn't need to do it. Um, it was quite helpful to do it. And the IRO have got some brilliant um, stuff there. I just wanted to get a better understanding of how some of the operational stuff works. And actually, the other day, someone was talking about customer service level two um, instance. I was like, oh, I know what they are because I did my IRO. And then I also did my um, track safety because, again, I wanted to, if, if we're talking to people about going in track side, I sort of wanted to understand the experience of it. Um, going out and, and seeing frontline colleagues and doing safety tours and things like that are other things where actually you go out and you just learn so much from doing it. But that ability to learn quickly, to connect the dots, I think, is has been really important. Um, I think the obviously working in the civil service, but also the atomic weapons establishment, getting that understanding into how government works. Why might the DFT be doing the things that they're doing and what pressures are they under and all of those sorts of things and just how government contracts work and those sorts of things. I'm, I'm not, by no means an expert in it, but I've got an understanding of the environment that we're operating in and how some of that works because of my past experience. And I think that helps. Um, and the, and the final thing really, and this is something the industry absolutely needs and it's a big focus is systems thinking, being able to connect the dots. We're in a really complicated industry and I don't think people realise that when you talk to them about the railway. When I say to people, well, well, I work for Great Western Railway, we run the train services, but we lease the trains, we lease the stations, some of them are run by Network Rail, some of them are run by us and then we maintain some of the fleet but not all of it because some of it's done by Hitachi and some of it's done here it's such a complicated system and you know that's the that's why the Williams review was was, was done in the first place but being able to connect those dots is, is something that's really really important and something that I think I've gained from places like the atomic weapons establishment where it is a big system of activity that happens has been really important so for me, the focus now that I'm three years in and I've got my IRO under the belt is to really get out there and try and connect beyond Great Western so that I understand the broader industry as, as best as possible. And that's one of the reasons why, um, along with um, Sam Barla, I'm now co-chair of Women in Rail South because it's a good opportunity to connect with others in the rail industry because it's a fantastic industry and the, the more we can do as a collective um, a, the, the better it is in terms of securing long term funding and commitment um, for the rail industry, particularly as we come out of COVID, but also to be able to fund things like the decarbonisation agenda and all of those sorts of things. But B, just because there's great people who work in our industry and it's a really good way to get to meet people, share interests, share best practice and to, to make some great connections. So 
I, I'll stop talking there. And if there's questions, uh, I know Wilson, you might have some, and, and there may be some in the chat. Just chuck them at me because I'm more than happy to to answer everything uh, or anything that you, you you chuck at me. And hopefully there'll be something that's useful for people. No, I found a lot of that very useful, especially when you were saying at the beginning that you didn't know what to do <laughs> and was was very focused on one thing. I was very much the same when I was doing my A levels. I was very focused. I was going to work on the railway regardless, but I was very focused, I'm going to go and do a degree in engineering and then become an engineer and work up that way. And it yeah. wasn't until I went to a university open day and saw something about, I think it was a transport management course and then spoke to the career advisor. I didn't actually go to university at all. Oh, okay. I sort of arranged some work experience with us at train planning over the summer, did a few odd jobs and got an interview in November and started in the following January and have been oh, there ever okay. since. And it's funny, isn't it? Because what you think you need to do isn't necessarily always what you need to do. Um, yeah. As much as my degrees are random, actually, they gave me the ability to 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 think critically, to look at things I'm interested in, um, to to you know to write well, all of those sorts of things. And if you could look at my career and tell that's all been really clearly planned out, and I, I'm ambitious to progress, uh, not because I, I like to be in positions of power, but just because I want to be challenged and I want to be in, in a position to be able to influence change. But I've not gone, right, okay, now I need to do this job, now I need to do that job. If you ask me now what my next job is, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, I, I know the skills that I want to develop to be ready for it, but I, I, I'm not sort of really fixated on it. I want this job, I want that job now. And that's where I'm heading for. And, and I think that's quite important in the railway as well, because it's a great industry. People stay here for a long time. And, and that's great because people love it. But it does mean that jobs get blocked um, and there aren't always exactly the opportunity that you want to come up. So I think having that willingness to be a bit more flexible and say, OK, well, what skills will help me progress and what sorts of things do I want to do and where my opportunities take me? I think that level of flexibility helps a bit. Sorry, there's a question that popped up and it got hidden. <laughs> um, this is one from, now I hope I pronounce this right and apologies if I don't, Rafaelia. Um, uh, hi Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I know you are passionate about reading. How do you manage to read so many books? Yeah, <laughs> I do. I, so uh, I, I have a little Instagram um, book page, Busby's Books, if anyone's interested. Uh, I do really like reading. Um, for me, that it, I, I've always read a lot and I do read quite quickly, so that, that helps. Um, for me, reading is a way of exploring things that I don't know very much about. Um, so I, I don't tend to read light-hearted books, I tend to read quite heavy books. Um, the book I'm reading at the moment is called Liberty. I'm not laughing because it's funny, but it's because it's a heavy book. I, I literally go from heavy book to heavy book. It's a, it gets released next week. It's called Liberty, and it's about a woman just after the American Civil War, um, a black woman whose mum can pass as white, but she can't. And she marries a Haitian and, and thinks that she's going to get a sort of a different experience of um, race and freedom in Haiti and, and doesn't. Um, so it's quite a heavy book, but it, it's interesting and it gives me an insight in to a different life view and that's why I find it quite interesting. Fitting it in, I've got two kids, I work a full-time job, um, I, I exercise quite a lot as well but for me reading's been a real um, solace during lockdown because it's something I can do quietly by myself, there's lots of noise going on either from Zoom calls or family and all of those sorts of things and actually it's just a bit of escapism so I, I probably only read half an hour, an hour each evening and then a bit more at the weekends. Um, but I am reading probably about six books a month at the moment. Now, I don't know if that's just because I'm enjoying them, so I'm going through them quickly. Um, but yeah, reading is just a bit of solace. So yeah, that's how I sort of fit it in. Not quite the questions I expect you were expecting, but it's still very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Nonetheless, and so my other half quite likes her books and reading as well. So <laughs> she's busy making book themed merchandise this evening. Oh, excellent. I've got a book club session later, actually, but we're watching a film, oh. obviously. But um, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about women in rail, because it's I, I work with Nikki in train planning and I'm, she speaks yeah. quite highly of it. Um, but coming from the outside and you don't really appreciate what it's about. 
Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, there's two, it, it gets, so there's two different elements really. So there's the, the national charity, Women in Rail, and um, the aims of Women in Rail, the charity, is to encourage more women into the rail industry in the first place, to support the women that are in the industry, particularly through things like um, promotion and all of those sorts of things, and um, to um, then do sort of good works and outreachy type stuff. And um, it's important because I think I think in the rail industry as a whole, only about 18% of people who work in the rail industry as a whole are women. And um, there were more during uh, the wars where the men were away fighting, but um, it's a very male dominated industry and it doesn't have to be. And, you know, there's so much evidence about diversity of thought leads to better business results and all of those sorts of things. And I, and I think one of the big challenges with the railways, the stereotypes that we give our children from a very young age, where we give boys trains and cars and we give girls books and, and dolls. And so uh, particularly given a lot of the rail industry is engineering um, based and we know there's not so many women in engineering, it's not seen as the thing to do for girls to go into a career in, in engineering or the railway. And so the, the charity Women in Rail is really there to try and readdress that balance and to, to provide some support. Um, and it's it's separated into the region. So Sam and I co-chair the South region. There's obviously London, the North East and all of those sorts of things. And then Adeline uh, Ginn is the um, the overall chair and there's a trustee board and all of those sorts of things. And there's some fantastic things like um, the Women in Rail Awards, which take place in September. There's lots and lots of events that get put on. We've got for um, the South, we've got a book club now, but we've got an event on Friday around um, well-being and how to manage um, your well-being. We had some pamper sessions last month. Um, we have done a session um, for the uh, nationally around building confidence. There's loads of different sessions in all the different regions, and 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 they're really great. They're they're free, uh, and they're a really great way to connect across industry, much like YRP is. It, you know, it's very similar in that way, and that it gives that um, connection across. Uh, Nikki, you mentioned um, chairs the GWR Women in Rail Network. And um, there are lots of um, company based um, women's networks within organisations and at Great Western, because we're a train operator and we've got the blend of um, on train stuff and stations, we've got a better proportion of women in the organisation than the industry as a whole. We have just got, I think, as of the end of last week, it's 26.2 percent female in Great Western now. Um, compared to 23 uh, percent three years ago when I started. So we've seen a, a nice shift. Um, and and that's uh, you know Nikki and the team do a fantastic job within Great Western. And I know there's there's similar versions in Network Rail and other um, other companies across the rail industry. And and they again do great events, bring people together. And I think it's about recognising that not only are there fewer women, um, there are gender pay gaps across the industry. And that's because of where women work in the organisation, and because there've been fewer women uh, coming into the industry. Uh, but that needs to that needs to close. There there probably still aren't the best arrangements in place for maternity and um, flexible working and those sorts of things. And there's a lot of work to do there. Um, there there almost certainly are still issues with people getting promoted and the 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 whole adage of uh, the, the the boys club and all that sort of stuff. Actually, in many circumstances rings true plus you've then got the things about well, like driving isn't that something a woman does and all the jokes about women drivers and all of those sorts of things so there's a there's a lot that that goes on and so some fantastic work that both the national charity and the, the groups within organizations can do to um, provide some support some connections some inputs and 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 raise awareness as well really i think i've got a good question to come off the bat of that from stephen um that's on about, hi Ru, could you talk about more about what diversity and inclusion means to you slash Great Western Railway and perhaps the industry as a whole? I think you covered quite a lot of it just then, but is there any further points you'd want to expand on? Yeah, so I, I, um, I when I first joined Great Western, um, Mark, Mark Hopwood had said to me in the interview, he really wants to improve inclusion and diversity. Um, so I said that's absolutely fine. It's, you know, I'd, I've done a lot of it in in the previous places I've worked, and I had we had a, it, it ends up being called the Didcot Day. We got had a get together in Didcot, not at my house, in a in a in a building, um, with people who'd been involved in in various bits of inclusion and diversity. And and there they said to me, or oh, can we call it inclusion and diversity rather than diversity and inclusion? 
because we want the inclusion bit to be sort of predominant um, and, and you, I can go down the definition of equality as people being given the same opportunities, diversity is having representation of different people across the um, organisation from different backgrounds but actually inclusion is the bit that means the most where you come to work feeling you can be yourself at work and you don't need to hide any part of you and and I think that's the really big challenge belonging is the other word that gets used in in, in this context now um, a lot more being able to be yourself at work is so important and I think lockdown has helped and hindered in that sense because through zoom you get to see into people's houses in a different way to the way you would never have seen before um, but you know we there's so much we can we can really separate our professional lives from our home lives and, and you don't want too much of a blending of the two but actually if you can't talk about who you are in the workplace and 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 be yourself without without fear of judgment or or, or punishment that's a rubbish place to be and and it, and it affects you in terms of the ability to speak up and challenge and all of those sorts of things and if people don't speak up and challenge you just keep doing the same things and you get the same results and you don't get any innovation or change so for me that's why it's so important and it is absolutely linked to culture change and um you know if we really want to have a customer centric culture we need to have that balance of people who are really really interested in the trains and the planning and all of those sorts of things but also people who are really interested in how we create a great customer experience and they're not always going to be the same people who think in those ways that would do the same things so you need that diversity because we're trying to do different things within the organization and i say i know it's a very minuscule thing but i know mark talks about and it's something that i've noticed because i'm not sure if you're aware i do trains monday to friday and saturday and sunday there was always uh, that stigma with mark because i don't know if he shouts about it a lot but you see any of his social media and I'm, he is yeah. a he is a bit of a train spotter. He's more than a bit of a train spotter. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen but the wedding he, pictures. <laughs> exactly, I, I was at the wedding, so I saw the class uh, <laughs> the class fifty engine appear, and he didn't know it was coming either. But um, no. yeah, and that's great because for Mark, his his hobby is his job. He's got his absolute dream job, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with people who love trains. We wouldn't have an industry if people didn't love trains, but you want different approaches and, and different things, don't you? But not everyone who loves trains is gonna be um, absolutely passionate about creating a really innovative customer experience that attracts a completely new segment of society to use the trains. For, for me, the, the inclusion agenda has to be about our customers as well as our colleagues yeah. Because if we want our industry to be viable into the future, particularly because we now think leisure needs to be sort of a bigger chunk of that market, we need to be attracting communities that aren't using the trains um, to use the trains and, and broaden up the market in that way. So, the, you know, it, it fits both ways, particularly given the power that the railway has to create opportunities for social mobility, different employment opportunities and all of those sorts of things. Another question from Stephen, if that's OK, he's a. Uh quite interested to hear about the transformation aspect at your role at uh, AWE and is this something you're also undertaking at Great Western Railway and he's guessing it's wider than digital transformation which is which they are involved in which I think I believe he works at the rail delivery group ah uh, right okay yeah so we um at the atomic weapons establishment I won't go into too much detail on it because obviously some of it gets a bit secret um so I won't go into it <laughs> it's only um, up the road for me yeah <laughs> yeah um the the transformation team I was involved with there, um, Ian, who was the chief exec, said, I want to pull a group of people from across the organisation. You know, we talk about talent. I want to pull, I think there were 15 of us all together, um, out of their day jobs, you know, go and sit in a room. Um, and, and I think he did this at Network Rail possibly as well. And you're going to come up with what does the organisation of 2025 look like? I think this was in 2017. What are we doing? What's our product offering? How are we making money? You know, what is our organisation of the future? And uh, it was an absolutely brilliant experience. Ian was fabulous in terms of saying, you know, nothing's off the table. Start with a blank sheet of paper. I'm not telling you the answers. I'm not telling you what, I, what I'm looking for. I just want you guys to come back with what does the organisation of 2025 look like? Um, we got to interview him, the other exec members and all of those sorts of things, anyone we wanted to in terms of what well, we think we need to know, this, that and the other. But pretty much it was go do what you like and come back. 
And off the back of that, I ended up heading up the transformation program, which was then taking elements of that work forward to, to put them into practice. Didn't actually do that bit for very long because I was then headhunted to come over to Great Western. So the, um, the, I, I got the program up and running um, and then left. Um, but that's because it was a great opportunity at Great Western. Within Great Western, um, the big focus when I joined was getting ready for the December 2019 timetable change, which is the biggest timetable change of a generation, 75% of services changing. But actually, it was more than that. It was the culmination of the change of the name from First Great Western to Great Western Railway, the culmination of the investment in customer services training with our great experience makers. So whilst there was a big focus on the timetable, actually, a lot of it was about it's the timetable, but we're providing you with a new offering. This is our brand. This is what we're now giving. This is how we can improve the number of seats available, um, increase the um, increase the pace at which we can get you from Bristol into London. Um, you know, the, this is the, the way that we're going to be stepping into the future, really utilising the investment that had been made in the traction of the new IETs and all of those sorts of things. So the focus really of the transformation was how do you change the culture so that you reorientate towards the customer experience um, and then maximize all of that um, sort of capital investment that had gone in with the traction and all of those sorts of things. So digital transformation is part of it, um, but it goes much broader than that and very much into the customer experience. So we uh, obviously got that in the timetable, launched it, went really, really well, and then COVID hit. Um, and um, so now we're sort of not back to square one at all because we've obviously got a lot of those um, the good, the good things in place. But now the challenge is much more, how do we reimagine what our offering looks like in a post-COVID world when we don't really know what post-COVID world looks like and we're not sure when post-COVID will be. I think it will be a living with COVID world and then a post-COVID world. So um, the, I, I guess really the transformation doesn't really stop, it's more, you know, it, it's about anticipating where things need to go and trying to get there quicker um, than, um, well, as quickly as we can really, so that we keep customers with us and keep colleagues with us as we're trying to do things differently. And some of that's about getting agility in, which is quite a challenge in, in, a, in a big monolith of an organisation. But hopefully that helps answer your question a little bit, Stephen. Um, one thing I'd like to add is what would you want to improve or change over the next sort of five years within rail? Um, so I think there's so much to do around inclusion and diversity still. Um, the, there's some good stuff happening, but I think the pace of the change is slow. And I think um, there's a difference between we've got an IND strategy, the strategy's good. I, I think oh, that sounds really arrogant, but the strategy is good, it's doing the right things. There's, for me, the challenge is, but how do you make that the lived experience? So I think there's something there about, you know, I, I want everyone's everyday experience to, to be that and not just be, I've said it, so therefore it's happening. And there's a phrase that I'd learned was beware the crocodile's tail. We can do lots of change at an exec level. We, we put the strategy in place and so we move on to the next thing and say everything's done. But that crocodile's tail can take a long time to whip around and, and catch everyone in the organisation and sometimes catches you out. So I think there's definitely more to do around inclusion and diversity, not least because the um, age profile of the industry is, is at the higher end. And we need to be bringing in the talent for, for tomorrow because otherwise we're going to fall off a bit of a cliff edge. I think there is definitely more to do around the customer experience. Um, how do we make it easy for people to travel with us, whether that's their experience of buying tickets digitally, understanding where they are at stations, the, the ease of not just the train bit, but getting to the train and getting from the train. And, and that links into the third bit for me around decarbonisation. We've got such an opportunity to make a positive impact from an environmental perspective if we can get people out of the cars and onto the trains. But to do that, it needs to be a great experience, but also one that's not awkward in terms of the to the station and from the station. Um, and I think the final thing is, I think we spend a lot of time in the industry because it's a big system and it's so complicated, having debates with ourselves about who's doing what, why, and what the industry should look like from a systems perspective. And I think leaning some of that up is really, really important. And that's why Williams was there. And obviously we've not quite got to the end of Williams, but there's a lot of time and energy invested in having conversations with other 
bits of the system when actually you could probably lose some of that. I mean, I know why it's there, but delay attributions are a good example of that, where there's a lot of time spent on chasing whose fault is it, rather than looking at how do we stop that from, well, not rather than, but in addition to looking at how do we stop that happening again, um, because the way the system is set up and it, from a funding perspective, so you're, you're spending a lot of time chasing your tail rather than um, just saying, we can make this better in the future and, and really make improve the customer experience in this way. I've been on the edge of my seat for Williams for must be a year and a half now. So I, I, keep, getting, I keep getting inside information. I will be out this month. And then I ask at the end of the month, so, oh, it's been delayed again. Yeah, I think we're in Perda now, aren't we? So definitely not it's, until after the 6th of May. No. Um, I imagine it won't be until after the 21st of June or whenever that mythical mm. date will be. It was just about to be published, I think, when lockdown kicked in, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and then obviously that threw everything up in the air. And I, I think the, the problem is, and having worked in government, the problem is with some of these things, you get really excited about it and then only a little bit of it gets taken forward anyway. And it's not quite as transformational as you thought it was going to be. So my my experience has always been, there's all, you can always delay doing something because you think something else is going to come and change it. Um, but quite often that thing that you think is going to come either doesn't come or doesn't come at the time you thought it was going to and you've wasted time where you could have been doing something because you think something's going to come and sometimes it's just better to go right okay I'm going to crack on I think these are the things that we should do and if it changes it changes but at least we've started to think about things that put us in the right place. So that's definitely the approach we've had to take in train planning recently when we've yeah. been doing all these Covid timetables is that we especially with the April 12th uplift it was like oh what if it changes or what if he pushes yeah. it back two weeks and it was like we just got to do it then just go with it anyway yeah exactly yeah. That's, that's been one of the things that i think has been really hard through covid has been the uncertainty about what's happening when hmm. um and i know especially in the early days we were obviously writing policies quite quickly about what it meant for staff and where people should be and all of those sorts of things and because the media were trailing things before they actually got announced people <laughs> were saying oh, I shouldn't be doing this, should I? And we'd say, I'd say, well, they haven't actually announced that yet. So until they announce it, I'm not putting guidance out about it. Wait till it happens. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get ready in the background, but don't start doing something that's not actually been told, you, you've been told you need to do yet. Because um, yeah. we're, we're, yeah. And that has been really challenging because there's just that confusion then about, well, what's the rule? What should I do? I don't know. I've always found it's just, a lot of it is common sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we've got about 10 minutes because I know you wanted to finish definitely on seven and I've got dinner to finish making so we might finish a few minutes earlier if that was all right with you yeah but yeah absolutely I just think especially HR is something that a lot of us moan about if we're honest <laughs> <laughs> we've had we've had it's PDR week, isn't it? So we're, I've had my time with my manager this week. But actually, when I had a chat with my manager, we had quite a lot of good discussion about not necessarily the day job, but how things are going in general. And I found that quite useful. It's yeah, and yeah, and and I would say it's PDR week in that it needs to be in. But I did all of mine in March because <laughs> <laughs> I like to be ahead of time. You don't have to wait till the week is due in. Um, uh, it's, but we, it's, you see that yeah. I, I I didn't get to make the choice. <laughs> I know. Well, and, and I think you know my view is you know HR. I, I would prefer to be called. I don't know, I, I don't know if Mark's on the web now. I would prefer to be called director of people rather than HR because HR just sounds a bit. You know, um, but then director of people sounds a bit weird as well. But for for me, it's it we should be playing a really fundamental role in the organization and yes we've got rules that need to be followed and all of those sorts of things but actually we should be making it easier for people to do their job really really well and i know people get a bit like oh i've got to do a pdr but like you say it's a really good opportunity to connect with your line manager to have that conversation around your development your performance and, and we know like time with your managers which are the ones we use for frontline colleagues i think at the end of March, 95% of people would have a time with your manager discussion. Three years ago, I don't know the exact figure, but it was much, much lower than that. And our engagement scores were not as good. And there is definitely a correlation between having time with your manager to talk about you as an individual, not just talk about like the job that you're doing uh, there and then and how engaged you feel with your work. And, and so um, 
I think some of the misnomers sometimes is, oh, HR have told us to do this, the HR police. And actually, <laughs> yes, we do sometimes because there's employment law that we need to make sure we follow. But, you know, sometimes we're telling you because it's really good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so I just uh, did the image of Toby way. from the office. <laughs> if you've yeah. ever watched it, it's like... <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's a really yeah. It's not we we're not. That's not what we're aiming for. The office no. style of paper is not the not the intent. <laughs> ah, but uh, it has been very interesting having you on this evening, and I think I will let you get on with the rest of the evening because I know you've had a very busy day. And I think I'm on leave tomorrow. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> no, I enjoy it. I've had two weeks of leave, so I'm just back to work now. So uh, uh. <laughs> all meeting tomorrow. So uh, I'll be. Uh, all smart and ready to ask any questions that um <laughs> but thank you thank you. i hope hopefully it's helpful and you know i'm on linkedin if people want to connect with me and ask me anything they didn't want to ask on here so yeah it's great to to be with you all and um good luck with the rest of the yrp events um this year so thank you very much ruth and thank you everyone for attending uh any issues please contact me via the uh, young rail professionals website there is a message function on there or additionally, email me at wilson.hill at youngrailpro. Otherwise, I hope you all have a very good evening and I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. And, uh, I can't actually end it now. What's going on? <laughs> I've never had that before. There we go. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>